Well, buenas noches. I appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, Mimi and I were praying that this presentation will be not for you, but rather for our friends, Roman Catholics. In such a way that by I speaking to Roman Catholics, we will learn to communicate with them, with them, with respect, with compassion, with mercy, with love. So um, there are things that may sound not not very good to our eyes, uh, but happens to be part of doctrines of other churches. And our job is not to criticize them, but to rather to understand what is it that they believe and kind of uh, show them the difference between their doctrine and the biblical doctrines. Um, a, a form is going around so you can write down your name and an email in case that we have to change plans or cancel or whatever, we will have the opportunity to communicate with you. So kindly leave us your telephone number and your email. <clears throat> in Galatas, well, let's pray before. Heavenly Father, we cry out to you for your mercy upon us, that you will empower us with your spirit to understand your scriptures, to understand clearly your gospel and to exercise our love for others, that we, as beggars who found bread, we will be able to share this bread with others who are also in need of your salvation and your mercy. It is in the name of the Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen. In the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 6, <clears throat> The Apostle Paul says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than the one we had preached to you, let it be a course. Or the Bible says, anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, see, when the Bible says something important, it said twice. And it, what is extremely important, like the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy is three times. But here it says it again. As I have said before, so now I say again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let it be a course. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I will not be a bond servant of Christ. So the name of the objective really is the gospel. And the question is, what is the gospel? The Bible was not translated until very late uh, and began as more serious translations after Wycliffe and the Reformers. Not by that that I am not saying that Wycliffe is not a reformer, but before the Bible was translated into the native languages, 
that people could read and understand what the Bible says. The Bible was in Greek, Hebrew, Aramean, Aramean and Latin. And only people who spoke those languages were able to understand. So, when people read the Bible in those languages and tried to understand what he was saying, they will interpret the scriptures and present the scriptures to other people. But since it was in oral tradition, then the first people who hear will tell others and they will tell others and they will tell others and when you get to the end of the line, do you remember those stories that you, stories that you did in college? That you will give a message to someone and you ask that person to go around and present that same message to the last person and then you'll ask the first person to, to tell the story and the second person to tell the story that he heard and he will hear a totally different story or very altered. That is what happened to the Bible. I was going to be a Roman Catholic priest. I was on my way to Rome to, be, to finish my studies and to uh, seek ordination. In the seminary where I study, we did not have a Bible. None of my classmates had a Bible. I never studied the Bible. There was a big Bible in the library in the seminary, but it was gigantic. We just would go there and, and, and uh, read out of curiosity. In the Roman Catholic Church, the, the preaching of the Word is not expository preaching. It's not the entire Bible. It is uh, the passages that they use here and there, uh, but are not like in the Reformation preaching that it has to be it has to be expository, entire chapters, entire books, uh, making sure that whatever is preached is not taken out of context, but rather is um, within context, not only within the chapter, but within the book and within the entire Bible. When truths of the Bible are taken out of context, you probably end up with a different doctrine and a different gospel. This is what was happening in the Middle Ages. The, since the Bible was not available in the language that the people understood and could validate what they hear, they had to believe what people thought that the Bible said. So doctrines were created and that do not agree with the Bible. So, the question is, what is the Gospel? And we need to begin there before we analyze, we compare the doctrines of the official, the official doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church with the doctrines of the Bible. The Gospel is very simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be safe. Trust that Christ on the cross paid in full for those that he came to save. The, we have to believe that the second person of the Trinity that is fully God at the time in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is the first verse in chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is the second person of the Trinity 
indicated beginning without beginning, the same substance of the Father, the same substance of the, the one person in the uh, three persons, one God, and the second person of the Trinity in verse 14 of John, what happened? And the Word became flesh and lived among us. The second person of the Trinity now becomes, take, becomes man, and now is fully man and fully God, and live among us. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 21, the angel tells Joseph that that baby in the womb of Mary is from God, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and his name shall be Jesus. The second person of the Trinity at the birth of the Lord Jesus receives the name of Jesus. And he is the only one in the entire cosmos, in the entire universe, that has two natures, the human nature and the divine nature. Because he has a human nature, he can identify with us and carry our sins and, 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 and understand us completely. And as a divine person, being God has the sufficient merits to pay in full to an infinite God for our sin against the Holy God. That's why Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, in the life. No one go, goes to the Father but through me. No one goes to the Father but through me. How many can go to the Father but through me? Zero. So Jesus, <clears throat> because he is human and because he is divine, he can represent us well and he can represent God well and therefore he can pay in full for our sins. The Gospel is very simple. At the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cries out to Father, saying, if it is possible, pass this cup from me. Ask three times. Basically he says, Daddy, Daddy, if it is possible to save anyone through any other person, or through any other mean, do not kill me. He would like to be there. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in the Kindred Valley, you can see the Mount of Olives, where he took off and where he will come back. And at the same time, you look up and you see Calvary. Same distance, almost. And he is at the Garden of Gethsemane, where the meal is there, where they crush the olives to make olive oil. And he probably is there remembering that Daddy says in Isaiah 52 and 53, it pleased the Father to what? Crush him. So he three times says, if it is possible to save anybody, pass this cup from me. Daddy, do not kill me. The words, the, the, guard, the cosmic silence of Gethsemane. There was no answer because there was no other way. The next day, or day and a half, he's already at Calvary. Now he's on the cross and he doesn't say, Daddy, Daddy. He says, My God, my God, why? Why did he say God? He is in front of a judge. He is expecting the entire wrath of God that was coming upon us to come upon him, to pay in full for the sin of his people. 
And there was no answer either. God turns away his face from him. It becomes dark, takes the light out of Jesus and the tremendous pain of that momentary separation from the Father. That abandonment is the hell that Jesus went to pay in full for our sins. And at that moment, the wrath of God came upon him. Our sin gets burned on his body. And the righteousness of Christ is transferred to us and our sin to him to be burned by the wrath of the Father. And we are declared at that moment not guilty, justified, and we can go to heaven at any time. After all is done, he says, it is completed. And the veil of the temple rips for us to walk through the temple to the Holy of Holies, to have a direct relationship with God, being Jesus Christ, the only priest, the only high priest, and at that moment, in the book of Hebrews, about eight times annuls the priesthood of men. Two will replace it by the priesthood of the eternal priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. We go through. That's why he says, no one goes to the Father, Father but through me. And when all is completed and that veil opens so we can go straight to the Father, he goes back to the relationship with Daddy. He doesn't say, God, my God, anymore. He says, Daddy, into your hands I commend my spirit. Amen. What a wonderful plan of salvation. Anyone who trusts in Christ alone for his her salvation receives the justice of God upon the Lord Jesus and is free to go to heaven. And just before I continue, anyone who trusts in Christ receives the wrath of God upon Jesus and the mercy and the love of God transferred in the righteousness of Christ to us. So on the cross, love and wrath of God kiss for the ones who trust in Christ. For the ones who do not trust in Christ, but trust in any other gospel or any other means of salvation, the wrath of God will be upon them for eternity. And as Dr. Sproul said, hell is not fair to God. Because even a person who spends eternity in hell will never be able to justify the wrath of God, will never be able to pay in full for his or her sins, and that's why is eternity. But for those who trust in Christ, with the blood of the infinite God incarnate, we will pay in full, will satisfy in full the wrath of God that comes from His justice and His holiness. That is the Gospel. Now, let's look at the Gospel. Before we go into the other Gospels, let me say this. After the Reformation, when the Bible was translated and the Reformers understood the Gospel by reading the Scriptures, five statements were made that covered the entire Biblical theology and the entire Gospel. The first statement is sola scriptura which means 
that the supreme authority is the scriptures. The scriptures speak for the infallible God. Therefore, the scriptures are infallible and they never change. In the scriptures, we know, we learn, that salvation is by grace alone. And the word alone is extremely important as we depart from the Middle Age when the scriptures were not known. Now we use the word alone. The scriptures alone are the only supreme authority. Then what do we find in the scriptures? Ephesians, because by faith you have been saved. Through, I mean, by grace you have been saved through faith. So we find the second statement of the Reformation, sola gratia, and those statements are in Latin. Sola gratia means that we are saved by grace alone. Anyone who is saved is saved because God gave that person the gift of salvation is by mercy alone, by the grace of God that have chosen you before the foundation of the world as the God's ship and sent his son to reclaim his lost sheep. So he came to save his sheep. So he gave mercy to his chosen people. And what is the gift or the mercy of the grace that he gave? Is the instrument of salvation. I want you to remember that clearly. The instrument of salvation in the scriptures is faith. We are saved by faith alone. The moment anyone places his, her faith and trust in Christ, that person is safe. So the instrument of salvation is faith, is not baptism of water. So you are safe under the authority of the scriptures, sola scriptura, sola gratia, by grace alone. And what is the instrument? Through faith alone. Faith in what? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Not faith in your works. Not faith on how good things you do. Not faith on the pastor. Not faith in the church. Not faith on the priest. Not faith in any other person or instrument. But faith in Christ alone. The entire scriptures is about Christ. Therefore, Christ is the only, only way of salvation. There, is, there are not several means of salvation. There is only one. I am one of the ways. No. I am the way. The truth. The life. No one goes to the Father but through me. So is Solus Christus. Those are four big statements. The fifth statement of the Reformation that they found in the scriptures is soli deo gloria. So we are safe really not to go to heaven. That's the icing on the cake. We are safe to give glory and honor to God. Because no one can please God without faith. The only way to give honor and glory to God is when we have faith in Christ. And everything that we do, we do it because the pure in heart, in heart, the ones who are born again, they can see God. 
in everything they do. You remember that? The pure, blessed are the pure in heart because they can see God. They will see God in everything. So, anything we do, we'll do it to the glory of God. So, that is the gospel. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. I, as I mentioned to you, was going to be a Roman Catholic priest. And I changed by a series of events the trip to Rome, to the United States, to Philadelphia. And I enrolled at the university in Temple University, studied school business administration, and became a high school principal. And the high school principal was a beautiful, beautiful uh, teacher there. And her name was Miss Cordon, Miss Mimi Cordon. I don't want to say Corleone. <laughs> so I marry Mimi. And then Mimi and I were very Catholics. In fact, Mimi was the singer in the church, and a Monsignor was our pastor. Monsignor is a person like a bishop in charge of other priests and other. And she was afraid to die and go to purgatory. She would actually cry of the fear of purgatory. Now let me explain to you what is purgatory. Purgatory is a place invented officially in 12, pardon, pardon me, uh, 13, I'm not sure if it was 1339, 1239, I get that information correct the next time I'm with you, I have it in my dissertation, at the Council of Florence. Before that date, I think it's 1239, before that time, purgatory officially did not exist. It was not official doctrine. Purgatory is a place in, invented by the Roman Catholic Church at the time, by Roman Catholicism. But when we read the scriptures, we discover that there are only two destinies in eternity. Heaven and hell. And the Lord Jesus spoke more about hell than heaven. Brothers and sisters, because it is urgent. It is urgent. The reason why we are here is to really present the gospel with love because we see that the Bible has presented a very simple <coughs> gospel, very easy gospel. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So, they invented a place, intermediate, that if a person is not fully, fully clean of their sin, they go to a place in between earth and heaven, that it will be like a little hell burning for years. It could be one day, it could be five years, it could be ten years, hundred years, five thousand years, seventy thousand years, whatever. And you could not until the flames of purgatory will clean you completely to be able to enter into the presence of God because God can not be in front of any blame of sin. So the flames of purgatory will have to clean you completely in order to go to heaven. The Bible doesn't know anything about that. 
In any event, Mimi was afraid to go to that place. And she would cry. So, for the first time, since I didn't know what to do, I decided for the first time to read the Bible. And my objective was not to read the Bible to become a Christian. My objective was to read the Bible to look for purgatory and what could it do for my Mimi. And I took a magic marker and I underlined anything that would look like purgatory but guess what? I could not find anything at all. And since... So, but I found in the Bible something magnificent, something extraordinary. And I'm going to speak here to the dear ones who are Roman Catholics. As a Roman Catholic, and the majority of the Roman Catholics do not have assurance of salvation. If you ask me where do you go after you die, the answer for the majority of Roman Catholics is I do not know. I hope so. I expect so because I am basically a good person. I, God is so good that He will have mercy upon me. But I don't know, I will know when I, when I will get there. And that, dear ones, is way too late. But to find in the Bible that you can know without any doubt that you are going to heaven when you die is a comfort in life. It is a magni It will give you the freedom to live fully for the glory of God and for your own comfort. It is simple, and I found that in the Bible from the very lips of the Lord Jesus. In John 3, 3, the Lord Jesus says, you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. And in John 3, 5, he says, you must be born again. Surely, surely, I tell you twice, you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. Changes the verb from to see to enter. Because when you are born again, when you are born again, you immediately see two kingdoms. The kingdom of God that opens up to you and the kingdom of Satan where you were. And you run to the feet of Jesus irresistibly. Nobody has to force you to go anywhere because uh, you can, uh, you see the tremendous need to be there. So, when verse 18 of chapter 3 of John comes, and it came to me and actually was the verse that made the shoot me, because it's probably the most beautiful verse in the entire Bible and the most terrible one. The first part says, if you believe, you are safe. Do you see the tense of the verb? It's not that you will be safe, that you are safe. That is assurance of salvation. The moment you trust in Christ alone, you are safe. And the second part, it's a terrible one. It's hard to say it without crying if you think of the dear friends and family and other people who do not trust in Christ alone for their salvation. It says, 
But if you do not believe, you are what? Already condemned. Why? Because you didn't do good things? No, because you do not believe in the only name of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the simplicity of the gospel. If we love anybody, we should demonstrate our love by going and showing them the gospel. And I, I need to give you this short example. If you present the gospel to anybody, or if there's any Roman Catholic out there who sees this video, and have children, one of the best ways to hate the children is not to show them the way to heaven. And the most magnificent way to love the children is to show them the way to heaven. I was traveling to, in missions to Panama and Balboa, and I took a taxi cab, and I don't bore you with the details. And when I got into the taxi, the taxi driver asked me, what do you do? And I thought that I, was, I would make points with him, and I said, I'm a missionary. He became extremely angry. He said he wanted to kick us out of the taxi. We have to beg him to please take us. He says, every Christian that sits there begins to talk to me about that Jesus and that thing. I don't want you to say anything about God or anything. Look at my arm. This is my God. Look at my taxi. This is my God. This is what gives me food. Do you understand that? So, yes, sir. Quiet. And I began to ask him about his family. And he spoke with great deal of enthusiasm about his 13-year-old son, who is almost like better than a professional soccer player. A tremendous soccer player. And he actually showed me pictures and I said, keep your eyes on me. <laughs> but he spoke so beautiful about his son that literally I fell in love with this family. And when I was getting closer to the place where God, I dared to say again, I said, and what happened when you'll die? Where would you go? He says, we are like dogs. We die and that's it. And I said, you just spoke so beautiful about your son that I actually fell in love with him. Do you really believe that your son is a dog that is going to disappear? That's it? You know, if you don't want to hear, if you want to go to hell, it's okay. But do you want your son to go to hell? Do you want your son not to experience the beauty of heaven by showing him at least the way to go to heaven? If you don't want to know, would you like to know, at least for the sake of the love of your son? Because you love him, but you don't love him enough to show him eternity with God. You actually are expressing hatred, hatred about that dog. He turned and says, what is the way to heaven? It's a way. So I began to explain the gospel. And it was way too short of the time because we had arrived. So I said, I don't have the time, but if you can give me your email, and I will continue this conversation by phone or anything like that. He said, okay, but if you want to, you can stay and listen because we are going to be talking for three hours about the gospel. He parked his taxi, stayed for the three hours, cried all the way back, taking us. He says, I just can't believe that today God rescued me. I can't wait to get home. And then he continues to send me uh, emails and uh, pictures 
in WhatsApp. And the first picture that he sent, he says, I'm sending the picture of a dog that now is a child of God. Mm -hmm. And send me the picture of his son. What am I saying, dear ones? Just, the gospel is simple. Just present the gospel to those children that do not know any better. Now, let me compare to you this gospel that we talked about with the gospel in the Roman Catholic Church. And I wrote my dissertation about a comparative study of the official doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church and the Holy Bible. And the Vatican wrote a book against me, or for me, to me, actually they dedicated the book to Noé. And they say on the first page that Noé loves the Roman Catholics enough not to speak negatively about the Roman Church, not to speak against the Roman Catholics, but fairly making the presentation of what the differences are. And that in that respect, they believe that I love the Roman Catholics. This had opened so many doors. Of course, in the second page, they said that Acosta really doesn't realize that this Reformation thing was quenched 500 years ago and that he is joining Martin Luther and other people like R.C. Sproul, I actually mentioned their name here. So, but it doesn't matter. I would like to present to you the difference between this gospel that we are talking about with the gospel of the Roman Catholic Church. In the Roman Catholic Church, first of all, there are three authorities. And the three authorities are equal. And they said that in this book that was published for the entire Roman Catholic Church, for the entire world, is like as big as the Bible, with all the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. I dare to say that I have spoken to many Roman Catholics that do not even know that this book exists, or they don't even know what this book has. So, the Roman Catholic Church in this book, signed by John Paul II in 1994, was published in Latin at that time, and then in English in 1996. Says that the Roman Catholic Church has three authorities. The Bible, the traditions of the Church, and the magisterium of the Church, which is the Vatican, the councils, the bishops, the cardinals, and the priests. That is the magisterium of the Church that makes the decisions about doctrine and faith and, what, and, and, and morals. These three authorities, they claim, are equal. None can stand without the other. And specifically, they said that the Bible cannot stand without these other two authorities. There is a problem here. If there is a difference between the Bible and the tradition or the authority of the church, then which one do you obey? Is that a fair question? Which one do you obey? In this Bible, it says that salvation, the instrument of salvation is faith alone. Or faith.
in the catechism, he says, no, is baptism of water, is the instrument of salvation, plus faith, later on, and works. Here he says, faith. Which one is right? In this book, it says that there is no one without sin. Zero. Everyone is in need of Christ. Romans 3.10 There is no one, not even one. In this book, it says that there is one who never sinned. Who never, ever sinned. Was born without sin, someone besides Christ. Was born without sin and never sinned. This says no, this says one. Which one is right? And you go on and on. The magisterium of the church at one point said that the separated brethren who do not believe in the Roman Catholic traditions or authority are never going to make, make it to heaven. And another pope came and said, now we embrace the separated brethren. So, which one is right? He said, this book doesn't say that belonging to any specific denomination you are going to have it. It doesn't say that. You are going to have it only by trusting in Christ alone. Period. For your salvation. But here it says, you don't go to heaven if you don't believe all the dogmas of faith of this. So, as you see, there is different opinion. In 1854, Pius IX declared the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. That's the Immaculate Conception of the Mother of our Lord Jesus. It said, it said in 1854 that the Mother of our Lord, our beautiful Mary that we love, was born without the original sin. The Bible says that no one is born without the original sin. In 1854, you're talking about almost 1700 years after the Bible was written, that says you cannot add or subtract anything. The theologians began to question, some of them, even within the Roman Catholic, questioned the Pope. And they went to the Pope and they said, some of them, that contradicts not only the Bible, but also contradicts the tradition. Pope Pius IX responded this way, quote, I am the tradition, end of quotes. And the problem continued for 14 years. In 1870, Pius IX, for the first time, became the first infallible Pope. They announced the doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope. And the Pope being infallible, then he became the supreme authority. So, this equality, even though it says the same, they have the same authority, has changed. The new authority is this. You ready? The supreme authority is the magisterium of the church. The pope, the councils, the cardinals, the bishops, the priest. In the priest, the whole magisterium of the church is incarnate because the priest is in charge of the salvation of the Roman Catholic. The tradition will submit to the authority of the Pope. 
and the Bible submits to the authority of the Pope. In fact, we will get there, we're just giving an overview. In fact, they claim that the Roman Church birthed the Scriptures because they canonized the Scriptures. And we will get to that. For us, we have the same authority. But it is this way. The Church has authority. The Church has the authority to establish discipline. But that authority has to be submitted to what? To the authority of the Bible. The tradition has authority, as the Nicene Creed is in the tradition, but it is under the authority of the Bible. The Westminster Confession of Faith is under the authority of the Bible. It has authority, but it's under the authority of the Bible. But the supreme authority is the Bible. That's what we call sola scriptura. We need to understand, scriptures is not the only authority. It is the only supreme authority. Sola scriptura is the supreme authority. So, with the establishment of the doctrines of the Roman Catholicism by only interpreting that what they could understand without people having the opportunity to read the Bible and see the reality of the plan of salvation in the Bible. The Roman Church established a plan of salvation different than the plan of salvation in the Scriptures. That plan of salvation is like this. A person is born. The first thing that they do a few weeks after the baby is born, they will take him to be <coughs> baptized. So they go, the, the baby is lost with the original sin and in danger of going to hell. So somebody has to save that baby. So they take him to the priest. The priest gives the baptism of the baby and that baptism saves the baby. The baptism of water. Now that baby can die and go to heaven and can stay like that until he is seven years old or when he comes to the age of accountability. He begins to understand the difference between good and bad. And when he, and when he sins, he goes all the way here. He's lost again. How does he get back his salvation? He goes to Christ. No. You go to the priest. And through the sacrament of confession, that young boy tells the priest all the sins that he can remember. And the priest says, Ego te absolvo. And this baby now is safe. I forgive you. And he makes acts of penance and now he is safe again. And he can die and go to heaven. Until he sins. <laughs> the moment he sins, he is back here condemned. And he runs back to the priest. Ego te absolvo. Sin. Ego te absolvo. Save. And this person never has assurance of salvation. Because if he dies, when he is here, he's going to hell. Who is going to be responsible to save him? The priest.
please, with the compassion. If the baby is going to die, if the person is going to die, you call a priest and the priest gives him the last rites, oil, and gives him the confession and the communion, and that person can go to heaven because he dies and he does not have time to sin. Dear ones, the Bible doesn't know anything about this at all. In fact, the Bible says, the Bible says that you never lose your salvation. You are condemned. You are born with the same problem that the little Roman Catholic child went on the way to hell. But one day, God gives him faith to trust in Christ. And since it is God who gave him that faith, not a priest, and God is immutable, when he saves him, according to the book of Hebrews, he saved him to the uttermost, forever. He never takes back that salvation. It is so important and so simple for any Roman Catholic to understand this. We don't have to fight our beautiful Mary. In fact, we love Mary. The Bible says, Blessed shall call me all generations. Look to. If we don't love Mary and respect her, we are not honored in the Bible. We love the saints. Look at all the saints who help to write the scriptures. All the saints that trust in Christ and are safe and are in heaven and are here. We love the saints. But we go to heaven only through Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the only one who is God and man, human and divine. And because he is human and divine, he can save to the uttermost. Our beautiful Mary, the mother of our Lord, chosen by God before the foundation of the world to carry his son. She's beautiful and she's in heaven because she trusts in Christ. But she cannot save anybody because she's only human. And because he's human, she is human, she cannot be omnipresent. We cannot pray to her everywhere. Only God is omnipresent. Is, is an attribute only that is divine. And if God gives this attribute to any human, God creates another God. The saints, they cannot hear you because they are human. Why to drop the Lord Jesus and run to somebody else? That is a dishonor to the saints and that is a dishonor to Mary. The beautiful Mary said, in John 2, do whatever he tells you. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but through me. He didn't say with all respect, through me and my mother, or through me and Peter, and through me and the priest, and through me and the pastor, or through me and somebody else, or through me and purgatory. So let me finish story, and then we'll come. Sorry, about five more minutes. Then we, I began to read the scriptures, and when the windows of paradise opened for us to discover this beautiful gospel, I went to Mimi, and I said, look, we can know before we die if we are going to heaven. There's no purgatory in place, but it's assurance of salvation. She says, that may be very good, but that's not what the church says. That's only what the Bible says. Remember this? 
So I decided to go and talk to Monsignor. And we walked in, that is in St. St. Albert's in Philadelphia. And he was our friend, he's our friend, received us in his living room, very charming, very loving. And he looked at us and says, Mimi and I welcome. What can I do for you? I did not go for a debate. I went actually with the expectation that he could convince me that the Bible was wrong so I could continue to be a Roman Catholic. And I don't know what to say except being afraid. I look at him in the face and I say, Monsignor, if you will die tonight, where would you go? He said, I don't know. This is, this is close to the bishop. If the bishop doesn't know, what a poor Catholic will know. The best that I can hope for is purgatory. I say, Monsignor, that's the reason we are here. My wife cannot sleep because she's afraid to die and go to purgatory, so I decided to read the entire Bible and discover that there is no purgatory in the Bible. Zero. Besides, I found something against purgatory. I found, remember what purgatory does, to purify you in order to go to heaven. But I discovered in uh, Colossians chapter 1, uh, from 21 on, about three or four chapters of verses, it says that with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he presents us pure and blameless to the Father. The act that was written against us was nailed on the cross to present us pure to pay in full for all our sins. I say, Monsignor, if the blood of the Son of God, divine incarnate God, if the blood of the whole infinite God is not sufficient to pay in full for all my sins, then the blood of Jesus is not sufficient. And if the blood of Jesus is not sufficient, Jesus is not sufficient. We need to look for another Redeemer. And he said, and, and also I said to him, that purgatory does not exist because the time in eternity is different. I said that did not exist time in purgatory. Then Dr. Spur corrected me and said there is different kind of times in eternity. But in eternity the time is different. You, how do you count seven years or seven hundred years? Time by definition is temporal. He goes. So he looked at me and he says, you ready? The truth, Noe, is that purgatory does not exist. I could not close my mouth. I was almost like Colombo. <laughs> the beautiful, beautiful part of that is that that moment Mimi got cured. <laughs> they agree. But I say, Monsignor, if there is no purgatory, you are a high there in the hierarchy. Why do you teach that? And why do you teach your priest to teach that if that is not true? I almost said, remember that there is only one who is the father of lies. But I didn't say that. <laughs> He said, we do that out of pure compassion and mercy for the people who are in a funeral so they don't get 
tremendously sad and upset that their dear ones are in hell. Then I say, Monsignor, why don't you teach them the truth to dear ones? So those dear ones do not end in hell. I know the time went, but as we continue in the next sessions, we are going to look into those particular plans of salvation of the Church. And we are going to see a number of things that Roman Catholics should know about what it says here and how in the world you can be right with the Holy God by faith or by receiving salvation from somebody else different than the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to present these truths with love. I don't think that here you heard an offense against Roman Catholicism. We are saying things that are in black and white in the official doctrine of the Church, and we are saying something that is here in black and white in the official book of the Holy God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for this hour that you have given us. Thank you for the magnificent plan of salvation that only you, God, can create. Thank you for not passing us by and giving us this magnificent truth in your Bible. Trusting in Christ alone for our salvation. It is in the name of the Lord Jesus, your Son, that we thank you. Amen.